this uh, virtual panel on Ayaman. We are going to have a conversation today on the impact of COVID-19 in this conflict-torn country, exploring together Yemen's political and security dynamics. I am Eleonora Ardemagni, Associate Research Fellow at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies, and uh, this webinar is part of uh, ISP online uh, initiatives towards MED Mediterranean Dialogues 2020, the annual uh, uh, high level conference promoted by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and ISP. I am delighted uh, to introduce the panelists who are both distinguished experts of Yemen and both with a uh, deep knowledge of the field. So welcome to April Langlielli, Deputy Program Director for uh, MENA Region at the International Crisis Group, where she is Project Coordinator for the Arabian Peninsula, and she served also as Senior Political Advisor to the UN Special Envoy of the Secretary General for Yemen. And welcome to Ahmed Naji, no resident scholar at the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut and uh, a prolific uh, scholar researcher on Yemeni politics with articles, papers, and also uh, photo essays. As you know, this is an interactive panel, so I invite you to submit your questions for the panelists. Uh, through the QA function of the platform that you find at the center uh, of the screen, and we will collect the most interesting of them for the second part of the webinar. For Yemen, COVID-19 uh, is uh, really a crisis in the crisis. After five years of war, the 80% of Yemenis are uh, in need of humanitarian assistance. And the country is already theater of intermittent outbreaks of uh, cholera and dengue fever. More than 500 confirmed cases of coronavirus have been registered in Yemen so far. But the pandemic is heavily undercounted, sometimes concealed, especially in uh, Houthi held areas. And COVID-19 might affect harshly the most vulnerable groups who are present in Yemen. I think, for instance, to the about 4 million of internally displaced persons living in camps, and to migrants and the refugees who continue to arrive in the country despite the war, mainly from uh, Ethiopia and Somalia. Such a big humanitarian crisis can't be resolved without politics and diplomacy. But Yemen has currently three main centers of political power, as we can see in this uh, Chatham House map. Centers of power with different foreign backing. We have internationally recognized governments, the Houthi de facto authority based in Sana'a, and the self-proclaimed government of the Southern Transitional Council in Aden, plus a variety, as you can easily see, of local powers. As a matter of fact, Yemen state institutions fractured into small chiefdoms, most of them based on militias and the forms of tribal self-governance. In this context, the coronavirus crisis is likely to trigger further fragmentation across regional and uh, local lines, since the response to COVID-19 is not coordinated and it is highly localized. Ahmed, I would uh, uh, start asking to you, uh, how is COVID-19 reshaping the Yemeni social economic landscape? Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ispi, for um, this panel. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you to talk about the uh, uh, conflict in Yemen and the impact of COVID-19 on the country. Um, as you know, Yemen has been left, de uh, left devastated by uh, f more than five years of conflict. And besides that, uh, it's not just one conflict, actually. It's a conflict 
within conflict with so many crises beside, uh, not to mention the uh, different types of pandemics and disease. Uh, in Yemen, we, we are suffering actually from the uh, cholera outbreak, dengue fever, diphtheria, among others actually disease. And today, Yemen is facing the COVID, which is a global pandemic, but it has different story in Yemen. Because when, when you have uh, 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 five years of conflict in the country with all the consequences, and when you have economic, uh, 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 hard economic situations, and you have uh, almost uh, collapsed uh, health system, you cannot actually be able to do anything with any kind of pandemic. That's why the, the pandemic in Yemen is, is, I mean, experiencing different situation more than, than any other place in the world. So uh, this is actually something should be taken into consideration while we are talking about COVID-19. And the official numbers till today talking about less than 600 confirmed cases. I was talking actually to different doctors and different uh, medical and health organizations in Yemen. And they are saying that the number is nothing. This number is nothing. The, num the, the actual number is much, much higher. We are talking about dozens of people die on a daily basis. We are talking about hundreds or thousands of people are affected by the pandemic. And when you have no testing system, you cannot tell the real number and, and the, the accurate numbers remain unclear for, for, I mean, the civilians inside the country, for the uh, uh, local authorities and for the international NGOs. Um, uh, the UN actually at the beginning expected that if the pandemic reached the, the country, the, the, it would be, I mean, devastating consequences in the country. And they are talking about more than half million, more than half of the population will get affected by the pandemic, meaning that around 16 million people will be affected, and around 40,000 might get died because of 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 this, uh, I mean, uh, virus. And it was expected actually from the beginning. This, I mean, this devastating result because. Uh, we usually say the, uh, 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 the best friend of pandemic is conflict. So when you have conflict or war in a certain place, you cannot actually do any sort of positive intervention to save the lives of civilians because there are lots of restrictions, a lot of dynamics that are imposed by the conflict, by the war, by the warring parties, that prevent any sort of, of positive efforts to, to save the lives of, of uh, civilians. Um, going back to your question, I mean, I think there is a huge, huge impact when, when, when it comes to the economic and social uh, 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 implications on the uh, Yemeni society. Um, first of all, we have to take into consideration that in Yemen, um, people are suffering a lot because of the economic situation. And we have around 1.2 million of Yemenis have not been receiving their salaries for around more than three years. And when it comes to COVID-19, I'm fighting COVID-19, it's an individual fight. Uh, the local authorities, the de facto authorities, take zero consideration or take zero responsibility towards fighting the, the pandemic. So people have to uh, uh, take, I mean, this responsibility of protecting themselves, afford the medicine or the aid, uh, let's say, uh, first aid medicine to at least deal with the, 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 the first, I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, symptoms of the, the pandemic. So this is actually very, very difficult for the people to do so. And the second thing, is that people are in a choice either to, I mean, when, when it comes to uh, the uh, uh, measures that spreading over the world and talking about social distancing, people found themselves actually in a position to deal with two options, either to go outside and uh, 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 continue their life as they do normally, uh, with the possibility of catching the virus or to stay at home and face the, a problem of starvation. And I am talking actually to some 
people inside the country and they are saying that, yeah, for us, there is high possibility to die because of starvation. And it's better for us actually to go outside and do our daily routine lives because this is actually, there is a less possibility of, of, of uh, mortality or uh, death uh, possibility. So this is actually the second, the second point. And when, when uh, the third point, when uh, families uh, find one of their members actually affected by the COVID-19, they, they face lots of problems actually to find the bed and the hospitals because we are seeing that so many actually hospitals are closing their doors in front of patients. Not, they are not willing to do so, but they don't have the needed precautions to deal with patients first. Second, they, some hospitals are full of patients. And the third, people are not able to afford, uh, uh, I mean, the, the treatment actually bills. For instance, in, 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 in Yemen, we have around 700 intensive care uh, beds only across the country. And we have just 500 ventilators. And take this number in mind, we have just one oxygen cylinder per month for 2.5 million of Yemenis. So when you have this, I mean, devastating pandemic with this, I mean, very, very uh, uh, basic, and you cannot, I mean, mention it either, uh, of, of readiness to fight it, you cannot do anything. And because of this lack number of ventilators and intensive care beds, people find it very costly to, to, to uh, buy for, for the health system. For instance, in Sana'a, if, if you need to uh, ad, I mean, get your um, relative admission in a hospital, you have to pay in advance $2,000. So it's very costly for, for Yemenis. So this is actually the third, the third uh, 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 impact or the third point of the impact. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the economic uh, uh, situation accompanies with the uh, current pandemic, Yemenis today are facing lots of, of other, other economic conditions, uh, which make it even worse. Today, we are talking about the, uh, uh, the uh, collapse of the Yemeni currency, uh, even, I mean, more than before. And because also the uh, 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 remittances coming from outside the country, especially from Saudi Arabia, because we have more than 1 million uh, Yemeni workers in Saudi Arabia, and they are actually because of the uh, measures taken in Saudi Arabia, they are not able to work and to send to their families, which make it even very difficult for the families inside Yemen to manage and, and, and to, to afford the basic needs. And um, in terms of the social impact, I think there is uh, something that we, we found in Yemen during the last five years that despite the devastating consequences of the conflict, Yemenis showed a, a sort of interconnectedness among each other. There's a huge, uh, there's a deep social cohesion among Yemenis so that they are, I mean, helping each other and trying to uh, make it easy, easier for the others who are suffering a lot. So in, in a certain area, you can find people who are in a good economic condition helping their neighbors. So because of the uh, economic situation they are facing nowadays, they are not able to do so. So we are facing more and more economic situation and social also, impact coming because of COVID-19. So I think the current situation that we are facing, of course, will reshape the socio-economic uh, uh, dynamics for longer time because this is not a temporary crisis. I think this is uh, a knock-on problem and it will last for longer time because uh, we are talking about Yemen, not any other country and things in Yemen getting longer, and you take into consideration cholera outbreak, which was forgotten by many nations across the globe, while right? in Yemen actually lasted 10 now from 2017, we are still facing this pandemic, and we are talking about 2.3 million people 
get affected because of this disease. Thank you, Ahmed, for this impressive picture and also for stressing how much Yemen is diversified at its interior, also in times of war. Uh, April, uh, the 2015 uh, war uh, started as uh, a Saudi-led military intervention to restore a friendly government in Yemen and to secure the Saudi-Yemeni border. Both of these goals uh, have not been achieved, uh, as demonstrated by the launch of missiles and drones by the Houthis against uh, Saudi territory. The United Arab Emirates uh, shared the military burden with the Saudis, uh, especially on the ground, but pursuing also their own geopolitical goals in the South and formally opting for a military exit strategy uh, from the country at last. Now that Riyadh has remained alone, can the pandemic alter uh, the Saudi strategy in Yemen? Uh, sure, first, um, just thank you for the organizers. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here to talk about Yemen and draw attention to, uh, to this conflict. And, um, uh, I really appreciate uh, Ahmed's very comprehensive discussion of just the the tragic situation that's unfolding, just yet another um, tragedy for Yemen's uh, long-suffering population. Um, on on your question, I would I would say um, uh, a few things. First, um, I think the war started as as a civil war, so this is this is both an internal civil war in Yemen. And it's become a regionalized war, so it, it's it's a multi-layered uh, conflict, and, and you describe that that regional uh, angle well. Um, in terms of how how COVID could possibly shift the calculus of um, Saudi Arabia, I think really at at the big picture level, if we take a step back, I would say probably not. Um, I don't think it shifts uh, the strategic calculus um, of the UAE or Saudi. Um, because I think that calculus uh, was already shifting in, in 2019. Um, however, I think I think COVID uh, could reinforce or even augment um, kind of a, a decision that was uh, that seems to be already made. Um, in 2019, uh, both the UAE and Saudi Arabia uh, seemed to decide they wanted to draw down their direct military involvement in, in, in the war. Um, this was obviously more apparent uh, with the UAE than, uh, than Saudi Arabia. Uh, in the case of the UAE, which has been the, the Saudis, as you said, most important um, coalition partner, um, they redeployed their military forces from South Yemen, which is where they were mo more focused, and also along um, the Red Sea coast, uh, in, uh, for the most part anyway, in 2000 um, or in 2019. Um, and they did this for, for a number of reasons. I think most importantly, um, the, the UN had an agreement to stop or to halt a military assault on Hodeidah, which limited their, their military options. Both the, USC, the UAE and Saudi had hoped to um, shift the military balance of power in their favor in Hodeidah. Um, but also it uh, occurred in the context of increasing friction between the UAE and, and, and the Hadi government. Um, the UAE has been long frustrated with um, Islah um, and what they perceive as too much Muslim Brotherhood influence over the Hadi government. Um, also, it came in the context of critique from allies from the United States, from the UK, and conduct over the war, and rising tensions with uh, Iran as attacks happened in the um, Gulf of Aden in, in, the, in the spring. So the UAE made this strategic decision to uh, refocus, to, to kind of pull, draw down in Yemen and to refocus on other Priorities. I think at the same time, KSA, of course, it was it was less clear. But in 2019, you had a decision for them to revive um, back channel contacts with uh, the Houthis, uh, which led to some pretty significant de-escalation in late 2019 on northern fronts. And I think the, the this decision to kind of discuss with the Houthis to try to find a, a, a drawdown solution or try to, to um, bring to an end this this conflict uh, was again a basket of reasons for KSA UAE uh, withdrawal was was very important as it limits military options critique from allies also from from the UK from the US Congress uh, always building taking away from what 
um, of course, the crown prince wants to focus on, which is his domestic agenda at home, and also economic pressures at home too—a desire to to build on, um, you know, his e economic agenda, not uh, to focus externally. So there's a basket of, of issues, I think. Um, but the pandemic, I think, could reinforce these trends. Um, I think, you know, like like any country, like like all the countries. Um, <laughs> Uh, regionally, globally, I mean, you're going to see a, a focus domestically on, on economic challenges to deal with the economic fallout of, of COVID. And this makes uh, spending uh, billions of dollars on external wars uh, less attractive. Um, certainly UAE policymakers that um, we've spoken to make it clear that, um, that COVID um, makes more urgent the need for de-escalation in the region and stability in the region. Um, even, even more of a priority. It doesn't change the nature of enemies or necessarily priorities long term, but it makes de-escalation and, and, and stability more of a priority at this moment. I would note that um, Saudi Arabia um, did use the moment of the COVID outbreak um, to signal possibly an, an, uh, a desire to have um, some kind of ceasefire or wind down when it offered um, in April. Um, a unilateral ceasefire, which was then extended. Um, now, the way the ceasefire was offered was problematic. Um, the way it was uh, implemented or, or lack thereof was also problematic. I think politically it was a smart move for Saudi Arabia because it put the ball in, in the Houthis' court in the sense that they were then asked to, to respond to a unilateral offer. They, they immediately wrote it off. But arguably, I think at the bigger picture level, you have, you have the Saudis at least signaling um, that they would desire a, a ceasefire um, solution. Um, now, on the flip side, I would say that also COVID, from a, from a political angle anyway, might create some tactical um, impediments, maybe, to, 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 to drawing down the war, if that's the, the goal. Um, for example, um, and, and it's, it's tragic, it's, un, uh, I mean, it's unconscionable based on what Ahmed has said, but the fact of the matter is that none of the, the Yemeni belligerents, as, as far as we can tell, um, has really shifted their priorities based on the pandemic. So you don't have, a, they still seem to perceive political compromise as more threatening than the consequences of the pandemic. Well, you've had lip service paid to a ceasefire. We haven't gotten there yet, despite the um, envoy's efforts. So if you look at the South, for example, Saudi Arabia is trying to mediate between the government of Yemen on one hand and the Southern Transition Council, a group that supports separation on the other. Um, you know, these two have come to head several times. So they're trying to mediate um, kind of a, uh, both, both ceasefire and also a power sharing between them. But both of these sides are using COVID as a way to point the finger at each other. Um, and for example, you know, the, the Southern Transition Council has declared self-governance in the South. So some people in the Hadi government might see this as an opportunity to let them hold the ball for, for COVID, for example. So it makes the actual, in, in the tactical details of trying to solve some of these multiple problems in, in Yemen, it makes it uh, somewhat more complicated. But I think the big picture answer is, um, I don't think it changes the strategic calculus of Saudi or UAE, um, but it may actually, um, augment, uh, push forward, I think, a decision that seemed to have been made in 2019. Thank you, April. As you remember, the Saudi Arabia started in mid-April a uh, unilateral ceasefire in Yemen, but airstrikes continue, especially on Mareb region, which is the last fiefdom of the international uh, recognized government and also what remains of uh, Yemen's army. The Houthis had previously rejected the ceasefire, asking for the lifting of the blockade and also advancing militarily in Al Jauf and Mareb. And at the same time, the SDC, as you mentioned, declared its self government in Aden and in small neighboring territories. Ahmed, in which ways? Uh, are the main warring factions exploiting, weaponizing uh, the pandemic for advancing their own positions? Yeah, um, uh, let me say first, I totally agree with Dr. Ali because um, uh, when it comes to COVID-19 and the warring parties, it's, uh, it's, it's not their priorities actually. I mean, 
they, they, they don't give any priority to fight pandemic. I mean, what we have witnessed actually uh, till, till today uh, 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 from almost the wing parties is that they are actually continue their fight. They are continue actually working on their agenda despite the uh, pandemic consequences. So I think there's, I mean, let's say four, four ways. In, in my perspective, that the warring parties are using this pandemic in order to weaponize it for their favor. The first one, they, they refuse first to uh, declare the, or to uh, disclose the actual numbers of the pandemic or the uh, uh, cases. And at the same time, they don't allow the other organizations to take this mission uh, if they are not able to do so. And we have seen that clearly, for instance, in Sana'a. Uh, till now, they, they just announced four confirmed cases. And even when they, when they announced the affected cases, the first one was a Somali national, and it was a clear message to be sent to their uh, uh, inhabitants in their controlled area and to the other also uh, uh, international organizations that see we are doing our the important measures while the risk coming from outside our area and they were actually blaming the uh, 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 WHO at the beginning and then they moved to IOM because they were actually supporting some uh, they are supporting actually some Somali communities in Yemen and since this a uh, person is a Somali national, so this is the, your responsibility, not ours. This is actually how they perceive things. And the second one was mm -hmm. from a, 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 a national from Eden, which is actually from the areas which is under the control of the, normally under the control of the Hadi government. Uh, and they are also saying that, look, we are doing our measures again, and this is actually coming from outside, uh, outside our areas. Then they move to another approach, which as uh, their minister of, of uh, health said, we will just announce the uh, people who are recovered from the, the pandemic. We'll not talk about people who are affected in order to keep the positive energy of people, which is completely wrong because this, this matter or this approach makes it worse because people cannot distinguish the areas that can be the sources of the pandemic. And, and uh, they cannot actually do any sort of assessment or even worse for the international NGOs to launch any sort of humanitarian campaign to ask for more help for the country. Because till today, some countries say they are just 600 cases, not more than this numbers, according to the local uh, uh, authorities, either in South or in North. The second point, I think they are imposing cosmetic measures. For instance, the, at, the beginning of, at the beginning of the COVID, they, they set a sort of isolation camp. And you can say anything about these camps, except they are as isolation, because they have zero dis, uh, uh, social distancing. People live together in crowded places. And uh, this is just, I mean, one example. Besides that, they have lots of measures where they have no actually actual effect or can prevent people from, from the pandemic. Uh, and they use also the pandemic to uh, uh, tighten their security grip. So moving from area into area became very difficult and they are using actually the pandemic slogan and the social distancing and protection of their, uh, their, their areas but they are making lots of money because of this measure. So if anyone wants to, tra to travel from area to area, they can pay some bribes for the checkpoints and they can move. So this is actually one of the, uh, 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 I mean, uh, of the matters related to their measures. And the third point related to how they deal with affected people. They deal with them as they are guilty people, not, people are in need to health assistance or humanitarian assistance. And we have seen, perhaps this is in, in, in some areas controlled by the Houthis, 
that when they, when they receive any call or any, when they were informed about any case, and instead of sending ambulances, they sent actually, or medical crew, they sent uh, uh, some armed men to, to uh, the house of this uh, uh, affected person. Why they are dealing with this matter as, as a, as a, 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 a sent, uh, uh, with a sense of guilty. This is actually one of the things that we have seen in, in, in many areas. And because of that, people actually feel to some extent there is a sort of social stigma. So they try to cover any, any uh, 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 symptoms or any uh, uh, indications that they are affected by COVID. And we, we have seen that people using different terms when it comes to COVID-19. They don't say we have coronavirus. We, they say we have favors. It's normal favors. Because when they say favors, they can receive many things. Like, I mean, uh, social uh, gathering, people can take them if they die to the uh, cemeteries. And, they, and people actually can deal with them in a good manner. So this is actually one of the uh, uh, ways they are dealing with the pandemic. And the last point, which is I think the most devastating point and the most devastating way is um, using the time of pandemic to advance uh, or to extend their conflicts. So we have seen that in Marib, in El Jof, despite the consequences of the COVID-19, they actually keep fighting each other instead of fighting the pandemic. And in the South also, even between the uh, uh, Southern Transitional Council forces and the governmental forces, which is backed by Saudi Arabia and the SDC backed by Emiratis, they keep fighting each other even worse than before. Um, and a situation in Abiyan and the areas that witnessed uh, 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 this fight is horrible, I think. Uh, so this is actually just, I mean, uh, ways, I mean, the ways that the, the, the warring parties are weaponizing the pandemic and get uh, benefits from it. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, there is a question from our public. Uh, uh, is there any chance that the UTI's approach toward uh, a peace might change uh, in face of COVID-19? My feeling is that uh, you already answered to this uh, uh, question and the answer is uh, no. But I would also add for you, uh, are the UTIs closer now than in 2015 to Iran? Um, look, uh, I mean, in terms of the relation with Iran, um, yes, it became more stronger because they found themselves uh, in a corner with, with more uh, needs for external actor. And the external actor was Iran. So they are actually tightened the relationship with Iran because they think that without Iran, they would not reach to this strong position. And this is actually something obvious. Today, the Houthi movement uh, became a part of uh, a regional axis. So they deal with this axis with, with, with different commitment. So there's a huge commitment between, I mean, coming from Houthis to Iranians, and they cannot actually uh, leave this uh, external actor and go to other one, another one. Because, I mean, uh, they, they don't have any trust or confidence for any other external actors, given the uh, uh, events happening during the last five years. And speaking about uh, is the COVID-19 will leave some sort of, of impact, positive impact. I don't think so. This is actually what I always say that the, the pandemic diplomacy that the UN envoy um, trying to do, I think will not uh, result any positive because without, without uh, internal willingness among the warring parties, nothing will, will trigger them to, to uh, 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 go to the peace tables and start negotiating with the other warring parties. Um, because what we have seen in the last five years is more indifferences towards the civilians' concerns and more and more uh, 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 interest 
coming from these warring parties and more insistence to uh, go beyond their own interest. Thank you, Ahmed. Mm, we have uh, uh, many questions on uh, uh, diplomatic efforts to solve the conflict. Uh, and uh, um, April, uh, now I will ask you about uh, Yemen's uh, peace process that lacks a national uh, framework uh, and this, mirror, uh, uh, this mirrors the reality of state fracturing and security localization. Yemen has now the, a variety of political players with competing and also often uh, conflicting agendas. The Stockholm Agreement for Hodeida, broken, uh, brokered by the UN in late uh, uh, 2018, uh, was a positive achievement since it prevented uh, a military intervention in the port city. But local security uh, arrangements demonstrated to be unable to foster a comprehensive deal. Uh, so which steps should be taken, according to you, to relaunch the uh, EU UN-led efforts for a ceasefire and to reactivate a more inclusive peace process in Yemen? And, uh, how can the UN invest politically in tribal mediation in these mechanisms which are uh, traditional for Yemen and uh, very precious for conflict solving and reconciliation? Yeah, so thank you for the question. That's, um, <laughs> it is a difficult one, so I'll do my best in, uh, in uh, five minutes. But I think Again, um, trying to take a, a step back from all the mediation efforts that have happened in the last um, five years, I would say that after five years of fighting, now we're in our sixth year, um, this is really, I think, high time for um, a reset or a rethink of, of the international and, and, and UN approach to mediating and into this conflict. Um, I think that I mean this, the situation on the ground, as you said, has has changed dramatically, um, but the approach has has not shifted um, uh, to to accommodate that. I think there are there are three main um, challenges, as I see, or problems with the current approach. Um, first is that it's not inclusive enough. Uh, the second is that the substance is still very much tied to the beginning of the war and to uh, a, a Kuwait model, a negotiation that happened around. Uh, 2016. And the third is that the mediation tracks over time have become increasingly um, fragmented and, and, and multiple. They're, they're interconnected, uh, but they're not, they're not as coordinated as they should be. Um, so I'll just say uh, just a few comments on, on, all, on all three of those, uh, the first two being really the most important, I think. Um, so the issue of, of inclusion and, 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 and the substance of uh, uh, really what is possible in terms of a peace agreement um, is still, I think, very much being framed by, um, by UN Security Council Resolution 2216, which was passed um, uh, right at the beginning of, 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 of the war. And this, this resolution informed the peace talks in Kuwait, which has since been a touchstone for kind of the process uh, since. And it really, it, it has been interpreted, that resolution, to set forth kind of a, a binary negotiation process. So between the authorities in Sana'a, the de facto authorities, the Houthis, and the government of Yemen on one side, and it lays out a solution where essentially you have a new government coming back to Sana'a, um, re-centralizing institutions in Sana'a, with Ansar Allah or the Houthis being, this, being a minority partner in the government, and this happening after they uh, hand weapons and, and territory back to the internationally recognized government. So that's kind of in a, in a nutshell. But uh, as we know, after five years of, of fighting, while this might have been possible uh, in 2016 somewhat, it has become much, much less so over time. Um, one reason is that you know, there are basically five cantons of control in the country. Um, and these various armed groups um, have the potential to uh, spoil a ceasefire or a peace deal um, that they're not part of. Um, so we have to talk about the, the feasibility or durability of, of implementing any agreement that's, that's really focused on, on only those two parties, which aren't representative um, of all of Yemen. You also have a situation where, you know, the Houthis would argue that they're militarily the strongest. That is indeed the case, probably comparatively, uh, it, is, it is the case. 
um, and that the internationally recognized government has lost standing on the ground. That is true over time. But on the flip side of that, that doesn't mean the Houthis have won the war, right? There are many different centers of gravity uh, inside the country, and, and, and they're viewed as, as foreign invaders in many of these uh, places. Um, so the idea that you would have um, a, a government return to Sana'a that had, you know, maybe two main parts, or that the Houthis would be somewhat dominant in, and these other groups would then accept that, um, again, is, 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 is not implementable on, on, on the ground. So there needs to be a reassessment of, is rapid recentralization in, in Sana'a um, possible or even desirable at this point? I mean, these are questions that really, really need to be grappled with. And it's related to who's at the table. Because if you have more people at the table with different interests, you're going to get um, probably a, a different solution, hopefully one that's more um, durable over, over time because it's more representative. Um, the, the third issue is this fragmented mediation track. So you have the current effort of the UN envoy, that's one, and that has this COVID-related ceasefire, um, a number of confidence building steps um, to open up the country, uh, and then a return to the peace process. You also have UN efforts uh, to implement the Stockholm Agreement that you, that you mentioned in, in Hodeida, which is a separate track. Um, then you have uh, Saudi Arabia's mediation efforts uh, to implement the Riyadh Agreement between the government of Yemen and uh, the separatists in, in, in the South. And plus you have Saudi Arabia's track with the Houthis. So each one of these combatant parties has at times made success on one track contingent on moving forward on another. Um, and they've upended each other at different times and but there's no coordinating mechanism that puts them together. Um, so just, I guess very, very briefly on what, just some ideas on, on what could be done. I think um, the priority should be to free up room. I mean, from the beginning of the conflict, the UN has really, in some ways, had its hands tied behind its back by this structure. So to free up room for for the UN to open negotiations to a broader range of actors and, and, and track one negotiations to a broader range of actors. And so that we can rethink the, the terms of what's realistic. It doesn't mean throwing away the past, but what, what can be brought from Kuwait and, and what needs to be different based on Yemen's new um, political economic uh, realities. Um, it, I think, you know, it may need, it may just require a UN, uh, new UN Security Council resolution. This is not um, a silver bullet uh, by, by, by any means. Uh, as, you know, as, as Ahmed was saying, it requires also a change in, in kind of the, the thinking. I think there needs to be a, also at some point, you have to have a right sizing of what these actors think they can achieve from a settlement. Um, but it would, it would go a long way in helping, I think, um, and certainly there needs to be diplomatic, a concerted effort to put pressure on groups that have resisted uh, having more voices in a negotiation. Both the Houthis and the Hadi government resist any groups being added to, to negotiation. Um, and Saudi Arabia has generally supported a two-part negotiation. So there needs to be diplomatic pressure on these groups to, to open up the process. Um, on the issue of, of the multiple tracks and how they sometimes work at cross purposes, uh, Crisis Group has, has suggested for a while an idea that there, there could be an international um, contact group to support the envoy to coordinate these efforts that would need to include the P5, certain GCC countries, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Oman, uh, the EU, and, and you know they could come together and figure out some minimum requirements from these various agreements that would need to be achieved before moving forward, but also give the Yemeni actors a sense that there's some kind of momentum behind a process and it's, it's a concerted momentum and that the different external players are roughly on the same page. Um, uh, I would say just to wrap, just to conclude on this point, uh, you know, the UN's efforts to negotiate a, a COVID ceasefire and, and the CBMs or confidence building measures or return to talks are laudable and they, they absolutely should be supported. But again, the bigger question is, if you come to a ceasefire between the Houthis and, and the government of Yemen, or any settlement that's primarily between those two sides, is it implementable in Yemen's current framework? And I would argue it's, it's, highly, it's highly unlikely. Um, so there, there needs to be a, a, a rethink in terms of um, process and, 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 and content. Um, I know I'm running out of time, I don't wanna to speak too long, but on the issue of the um, uh, tribal uh, mediation, you know, Yemen is, uh, is tribal in some parts and it's not in others. So, 
tribal structures are, are, are stronger um, in, in some areas of the country and in other areas that would be a resistance to kind of using that kind of uh, mediation, um, areas that would consider themselves uh, non-tribal and more civil, but in, in uh, or having more, uh, more of a civil society importance um, and don't consider the tribes civil society, it's a debate. Um, but anyway, in areas where the tribes are strong, um, I would say that we've seen on multiple points that there are certain areas where especially tribal mediation uh, with sheikhs can be much more effective than the UN. And I'll just give you one example of prisoner exchanges. Um, many of the prisoner exchanges that happen on a fairly regular basis are negotiated at a local level. Uh, uh, tribal mediators are quite effective in, in releasing prisoners where the UN has struggled since the agreement in Stockholm. Uh, to get movement on a comprehensive uh, prisoner exchange. Actually, women's actors, women's groups have also proved to be, uh, in, in many ways, I would argue, more effective than, than the UN at, at, at prisoner exchanges. Thank you, April. Uh, I know this is a really uh, complex <laughs> picture and it is complex to analyze uh, in a few minutes uh, such uh, a huge amount of uh, uh, initiatives and uh, uh, layers also of a negotiation. Um, I would say that this is some sort of segmented diplomacy with many different segments and actors who uh, try to uh, push you for a, a good uh, outcome. Uh, one minute, uh, a one minute uh, uh, answer. If you uh, if you want to try this, April, uh, do you think the European Union could be the good, the right player to uh, um, create uh, uh, a comprehensive framework, starting from this segmented uh, uh, diplomatic uh, initiatives? I think the EU could play a critical role in encouraging a more joined up uh, international effort um, by advocating for a contact group. And there has been a positive reaction to this idea by EU member states, by some EU member states. Um, you know, the EU has certain comparative advantages in certain areas. One is that it has good access to combat actors on all sides in Yemen because it hasn't, it hasn't taken sides. So it has, you know, good access on, on, on both sides, which gives it credibility as a, as, as, as a mediator. I think, um, so pushing for an international contact group is one thing the EU is, I think, well positioned to do. Another thing that it's well positioned to take the lead on is talking about inclusion, right? Because the EU has been at the forefront of talking about a more inclusive process, uh, both uh, pushing for um, inclusion in uh, track one, but also the EU has run a number of really, really well done uh, track two initiatives that have worked with women, civil society, tribal groups, uh, non-elite actors. I mean, and so they have ideas uh, across these track two initiatives on, you know, what elements Yemenis would want to see in a comprehensive peace settlement, what values would need to undergird them, what are the steps, parts of the transition process. So maybe also one opportunity is to streamline um, these ideas from all the track two initiatives that have been sponsored and, and run by the EU and try to really put them forward as ideas that need to be accounted for in any in any agreement, any, any peace deal, so to have them be respected in any kind of settlement. If these actors can't be at the table in track one, at least their ideas can be, um, you know, it can affect it. Thank you, April, for this uh, analytical effort. Uh, we have uh, uh, many, many questions on the south of Yemen, uh, on southern regions. Ahmed, uh, uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis are strengthening their military presence and leverage uh, in Mahra and Socotra. There was also a question on this asking about uh, uh, if the UAE are still influential player in the south. I, my my uh, immediate uh, uh, answer to this would be yes, but I want also to uh, hear about you. And uh, Makra and Socotra are uh, areas of traditional Omani influence. How can Oman still play the mediator role in the Yemeni conflict if its own interests are now 
directed threatened at the border. Um, let me say that, yeah, I do agree with you. Um, the UAE is still there and, and south, despite the fact that they announced in July 2019 to uh, withdraw from, from south and come up with their new strategy, peace press strategy. But they are actually moving from approach to another, where they can count more and more on their local factions. And they, they invested a lot, actually, in um, south and of course they cannot actually uh, 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 leave easily this is actually one thing should be taken into, into consideration and what is happening today in in abian or in eden uh, is of course supported by the uee and this is actually related to different strategies between the uee and saudis because they have of course many things in common but still they have their own differences and we have seen that actually in Eden and Socatra uh, where, where the Saudis actually uh, uh, backing the local authorities. Coming to the Omani rule, I think Oman has been always described as a neutral actor in the region and they have good actually connections and good channels with every single uh, uh, local actors in, inside the country. But when it comes to Mahra, I don't think the situation, I don't think the situation the same. I mean, it's totally different because this is like a, 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 a borderline, which is a part of their national security. That's why we have seen Omanis are playing different role by supporting some tribes who are uh, or who are in the line of Oman uh, since long time, and they are trying actually to push Saudis and Emiratis from Mahra, or from from at least some districts in Mahra and Sukatra, and try also to to uh, uh, revive this kind of uh, nationalism among the tribes. Um, why they are doing so? Because they don't see uh, um, any sort of of uh, uh, stability if the Saudis or Emiratis uh, remain in these areas, especially with the differences between uh, Oman and these countries and the other side of the borders. We have Saudi Omani uh, disputes uh, on, on their uh, uh, own borders, and we have also uh, many disputes between Omanis and Emiratis um, related to different issues. So this is actually the position of Oman. Having said that, Oman, with all these kind of problems, Oman still have a room for doing a sort of, uh, uh, let's say, mediation, because the sort of uh, Omani intervention is a bit different from the other actually external actors. They are not even in mediation. They are not mediators. They are catalysts. They try to keep and maintain this kind of, of relation with everyone, even in their differences with Saudis and Emiratis, they have, I mean, some sort of channels and connections with the countries. They don't, I mean, go to, 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 to escalate this kind of, of disputes. I mean, this is, I mean, the uh, Omani, Omani, let's say, a mindset. And perhaps this is, I mean, another different of, of uh, uh, foreign policy intervention or foreign policy uh, 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 efforts. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, the security sector is another sensitive topic. Uh, if we look at Yemen, at uh, also to many uh, fractured countries and, and region. Um, April, which is the first step you would advise to rebuild uh, Yemen's security sector? This is some sort of one million dollar question, I know, but we are accustomed to think about the proliferation of non-state actors as a problem, and actually it is so. But Yemen has also uh, a variety of state-sponsored military auxiliaries, which are quite autonomous from uh, the army. Thanks to the rising power, for instance, of the Presidential Protection Brigade uh, protecting um, President Hadi. Uh, what about this? 
Okay, with five minutes left, this is <laughs> an hour question, but um, it's such an important one. I will just say that, <laughs> that it's some, I mean, it, it is a long term challenge in Yemen, right? And there's no quick fixes to it. Yeah, and, and as you said, um, you know, the, this war has made it much more difficult. It was difficult post Arab Spring. It's more difficult now because of the multiplicity of armed groups that are going to be resistant to giving up, giving up their weapons. Um, some are associated with the government, some, some not. And also because of the increased economic challenges, you know, that, 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 that Ahmed mentioned. I mean, and, you know, if you talk about demobilization of many of these armed fighters, these, these, these men, and also, unfortunately, young boys who are now mobilized into the fight, um, you have to have alternatives for them now. Um, so you have to have jobs for them to go to. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, you know, Yemen doesn't have much to offer in terms of an economic base for that kind of demobilization and the, the money and the funding that could have come from its Gulf neighbors in, in a post-COVID environment um, may not be as forthcoming. So it, it, it's a much more challenging question right now. Um, on the political side as well, um, you know, this issue of, of reunifying and, and professionalizing the army was not fully addressed during Yemen's transition. There were some general principles set out in the national dialogue, but there was no agreement on the relative balance between the military versus policing security services, or on how the military security services would overlap with, with the federal system. And this requires uh, quite a bit of detail that was never hashed out um, politically. Um, so it becomes much more difficult. I would just say if, if the war ends tomorrow, um, you know, the, the priority should be, um, you've, got, you've got to bound expectations, basically. Um, there's not going to be, I don't think, uh, a, 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 an immediate handover of weapons to any, any, any new government um, or, or, or territory. I think you're going to have to prioritize a ceasefire, a freeze the hostilities, separation of forces, getting groups back in the barracks when they can go back to barracks. Um, uh, and maybe looking at transitional arms control as opposed to just handing over weapons. Because, I mean, transitional arms control at a minimum is going to be critical for the Saudis who are concerned with ballistic missiles and are concerned with Iran's influence. So, I mean, there are issues that have to be addressed on principle, but it's very hard to see a rapid handover of, of weapons being, being realistic. So you might want to look at other alternatives. Um, and then, of course, there's just a need for a political discussion on these outstanding issues, like the balance between the military and security services, integration of forces, um, issues of federalism. Thank you, April. Ahmed, uh, uh, do you want to add something to this? You have one minute. Oh, okay, just one minute. Okay. Um, I, 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 I would say that I think... Um, <laughs> Okay, um, I think in, when it comes to the um, UN uh, uh, mediation uh, efforts, I think they, they should uh, uh, take into consideration, I mean, inclusiveness, as uh, Dr. Ali say, uh, said, and inclusiveness not among the uh, uh, um, armed groups, because the, now the uh, peace process is just bringing um, uh, the Houthis, the STC, and the, uh, the governments because they are actually having military power, but they are actually giving less attention to other uh, uh, community stakeholders. And this is actually um, a way why we are not able to reach any sort of, of agreement because the uh, interest of this warring or these militias is just to keep the conflict continue. This is the first one. The second point related to the gap between the peace process taken into uh, taken place uh, either before or now the virtual consultations and what's how the things happening on the ground because uh, there is I think a big gap so things should be taken into consideration nowadays there's a huge, massive conflict in different areas, but they have, I think, zero uh, attention, or at least not, nobody can talk about this kind of, of advancement or this kind of conflicts while they are, uh, I mean, talking about the negotiation. And um, the third point, which is the last one, I think what we should understand exactly the local context of conflict in Yemen. This is a multi-layered conflict. We have external actor, uh, actors, we have internal actors, we have within the internal actors different wings. So we need actually to 
to have different tracks. We have, we should have a strategy to resolve these problems. And this is actually need, like, I mean, a comprehensive, as you mentioned, a comprehensive strategy. And some of these tracks might need longer time. So we should be patient about all this kind of work. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. The reality is Yemen has currently too much political military interlocutors. So it's really a big challenge for policymakers, for the UN, for all who try to uh, analyze this country as you, but also to uh, produce creative uh, solutions for uh, the conflict. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we must end our conversation. I apologize with the public for the questions which were not answered, but a warm thank you uh, to all uh, for attending this webinar. And most of all, thank you to our guests, April and uh, Ahmed, for this brilliant uh, panel. Next uh, ESP virtual panel will focus on Libya on 17 June, so stay with us. Goodbye.